find the car. He's like, okay, you need to go to here. All like right. The matrix. Yeah, like the matrix, but it's like one of the machine boxes. So let's get started in 2.6. So we're going to continue our exploration of limits. But up until now, every limit that we've taken has always been as x approaches a number. Well, in calculus, we are going to play with infinity a lot. It's going to be our new best friend. I like to joke, mathematicians hide all of our dirty laundry at infinity. So we're going to use it to do some pretty good stuff. If we're ever sweeping something under the carpet, that's where it goes, is to infinity. So let's talk about what's happening here. So we want to talk about limits at infinity. So we need to remember through this whole process, infinity isn't a number. But we are going to talk about going to infinity. And that just means going on forever and ever in either the left or the right on a number line. Which means the number is either getting really, 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 really big or really, really, really small. And that kind of messes with people sometimes, because when we think small, we usually think zero, not large negative numbers, right? Negative infinity is really, really small because it's negative. So keep that in mind and don't get zero kind of messed up in there a little bit. So our limits at infinity. So the limit as x approaches positive infinity or as x approaches negative infinity is written, we have the limit as x goes to negative infinity. So instead of putting the number down there, we just put our infinity symbol. Or the limit as x goes to positive infinity of f of x. So <coughs> What this represents graphically is something we've seen in the past. We talked often in pre-calculus or in our algebra classes about the end behavior of a function or its horizontal asymptotes. And that's exactly what these represent. These are the end behavior of f of x. So. Let's talk about horizontal asymptotes. So the horizontal asymptote occurs, and it is the end behavior of a function The horizontal asymptote exists when the limit as x goes to plus or minus infinity of f of x equals L and is the line y equals L. So in our previous math classes, we found horizontal asymptotes using some algebra. We're going to connect those ideas to limits in calculus and generalize them, because calculus allows us to find horizontal asymptotes of any function, whereas what we did in previous classes was only really effective on finding horizontal asymptotes for rational functions or the ratio of two polynomials. All right, so now we're ready for our first theorem. And this is going to be one of the key things that we're going to need to evaluate these infinite limits. So if C is a positive number, then the limit as x goes to infinity 
of 1 divided by x raised to the c is 0. If we use our negative exponent law to move that up into the numerator, then we would still have the same thing, and that limit is 0. This is really going to be our key idea that we're going to use to evaluate pretty much all of the limits, at least for a little bit. So now, before we do that, we're going to do a little bit of algebra that's going to seem very different from anything we've done before. So we're going to factor something in a way that's going to turn certain terms in our polynomial into things of the form of our key idea from the previous theorem. So for example, if I asked you to factor x squared minus 7x plus 2, you'd probably think to factor it like a binomial. You'd look for factors of 2 that add up to 7. If I asked you to factor out the GCF, you would tell me the GCF is 1. There's nothing to factor out. Well, we're going to factor out an x squared. And you're like, wait a minute. There is no x squared in the term 7x, and there's definitely not an x squared in 2. Well, we're going to use properties of equality in fractions to help us out. So if we wanted to, we could take x squared minus 7x, and then I could build that as a fraction by multiplying the top and the bottom by x. And I could build the 2 by multiplying the top and the bottom by x squared. right? Because if you multiply a fraction on the top and the bottom by the same thing, does it change anything? No. If I have 1 half and I multiply the top and the bottom by 5, I get 5 tenths. It's an equivalent fraction. So now I have this. So I have x squared minus 7x squared over x plus 2x squared over x squared. Now can I factor an x squared from the numerator? Certainly. So I factor out my x squared. That gives me 1 minus 7 over x plus 2 over x squared. And if I distributed that x squared back in, and reduced, I would get back to the very first expression. So firstly, I included a whole bunch of steps that in general we don't need to do. I wanted to justify why this is legal and what's happening. But notice, how many x's didn't the 7x have? How many was it missing to have an x squared? 1. So when I factored out an x squared, how many x's ended up in the denominator? 1. How many x's did the 2 have? 0. So when I factored out an x squared in the final answer, how many x's ended up in the bottom? 2, right? To make it balance. That's the idea. If, it, if you need to write it out like I did for a while to help you see what's happening, by all means do that. But what we're really concerned with is the net effect at the end, what's happening. So now we factored out an x squared and we have this interesting looking rational function, x squared times 1 minus 7 over x plus 2 over x squared. Well, notice those last two terms fit exactly the form that we had right here for our key idea. So we're going to use this technique in conjunction with this theorem to resolve some problems. So let's do a quick try. I'm not going to put you in groups. So let's go ahead and so we want to take an x cubed out of x cubed plus 6x minus 3. So we factor out our x cubed. In our first term, that leaves behind a 1. In my plus 6x, I only have 1x. So if I take out 3, that means I'm deficient by 2x's. So that's going to give me plus 6 over x squared minus, and the negative 3 has no x's, so it's going to be 3 over x cubed. And that would be what our factorization would look like if we factored out the monomial x cubed. All right. So I know that looks a little funny, but we'll see why we want to do that shortly. So 
we have a technique listed here before we get to our next example. So our technique says for rational functions, we will factor out a monomial of the same degree from both the numerator and the denominator. The degree of the monomial to be factored out is the same as the degree of the denominator. So in this case, it says we need to factor out a monomial that is the same degree as the denominator from both the numerator and denominator. So what are we going to factor out of this? It's going to be a third degree, so x cubed. So we will factor out x to the cubed or x cubed from the numerator and denominator. So let's go ahead and do our factoring. So if we limit, take the limit as x goes to positive infinity, I factor out an x cubed from the numerator. So that's going to give me 6 minus 2 over x plus 1 over x squared minus 7 over x cubed. And in the denominator, I factor out my x cubed, and that leaves a 7 plus 1 over x minus 27 over x squared plus 81 over x cubed. So now, after we do that, I factored an x cubed from the numerator and an x cubed from the denominator. So what would happen? They reduce out and leave behind a 1. Well, that's nice. So now we want to evaluate our limit. And we have a whole bunch of things of the form a constant divided by x. And from our key idea up here, we know the limit as x goes to infinity of 1 or a constant over x raised to any power is going to be equal to what? 0. So then when we evaluate the limit, so by our theorem, above the limit as x goes to infinity of a constant over x to some power is equal to 0. Well, that would mean then this is equal to 0, 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 and this is equal to 0. Oh, well, if all of those things are 0, what's the only thing that's left? 6 over 7. 6 over 7. All right, so let's resolve this. So we factor out an x squared from each of these. So I have x squared, and that leaves me with a 6 over x minus 3 over x squared. Divided by, take out an x squared, I get 2 plus 11 over x squared. So now I evaluate my limit as x goes to negative infinity. That's 0, that's 0, that's 0. Nope, I'm getting out of control. That one's not 0. 2 is just 2. That one's 0. I just like crossing things out. You've got to be a little careful. All right, and then those x's reduce out. So then what do we get in the top? Well, I have 0 minus 0, so what does that equal? 0 over 2. That's 0. So Peterson. Well, because what's 0 divided by 2? 0. You can't forget the 0 on the top. So we're going to talk about the arithmetic of infinity. And infinity, as we saw in some of the previous sections, behaves like a normal number in certain circumstances. 
but it doesn't in others. So we have to be careful. So we, as we noticed, a positive number times infinity is positive infinity. Positive infinity times a negative number is negative infinity. So there's one listed in red here that we have to be careful about. Infinity times zero is not zero. Infinity times zero can be any number. It might be 12, it could be 167.4, it can be any number. It could be zero, it might be infinity, but it depends. So one way to think of this and in terms of limits, it's like a race. Is something getting to infinity faster or is it going to zero faster? If it goes to zero fast enough, the answer is going to be zero. If it goes to infinity fast enough, that's going to win. It's going to be infinity. If they're going about the same, it's going to be some number halfway in between. Well, it doesn't have to be halfway, just some number in between. So we're going to spend a whole section or so later on talking about these that are called indeterminate forms. They're special. We're going to have methods for handling them. But for right now, zero times infinity should put up a big warning sign in your brain. Okay, something that's like danger, you know, stay away, it's poisonous for right now. We don't want to play with it. So then we have our other ones, which is infinity times infinity is a positive infinity. Negative infinity times positive infinity is negative infinity. And negative infinity times negative infinity is positive infinity. So when we run into these calculating our limits, we're going to follow these rules. So for right now, if you ever run into zero times infinity, try to do some algebra to get rid of either the zero or the infinity so that you can evaluate the limit. So we can't resolve those at this point. So let's take a look at a couple of examples. And one thing before we move on to our example, I wrote all of the above things in the tables as multiplication, but multiplication and division are the same thing. So the same rules apply if things are being divided. So keep that in mind that the sign rules follow whether it's multiplication or division. All right, so for example three, we need to factor out an x cubed. So our limit's gonna look something like this. We take out our x cubed and we get 4x minus 2 over x plus 1 over x cubed in our numerator. And we divide that by taking out our x cubed, 3 minus 8 over x cubed. And as should always happen, those reduce out. And now we go to infinity. That goes to zero, that goes to zero, that goes to zero. Well, what happens to four times x as x goes to infinity? Well, according to our chart above, a positive number times infinity is going to be what? Infinity divided by three, and infinity divided by three is still infinity. So that limit has limit infinity. And if we checked our horizontal asymptote from our pre-calculus recollections, the degree of the numerator is bigger than the degree of the denominator, so it did not exist. So for our next example, we have to be a little bit careful here because we have a square root, right? Okay, so square roots aren't so bad, but we're going to negative infinity, so we need to be a little bit careful as we do this. So let's start by analyzing each of these. So we're going to be factoring out an x from both the numerator and denominator. So we take the limit as x goes to negative infinity. And in the numerator, under the radical, I'm actually going to factor out an x squared. And we'll talk about why. And that leaves 2 plus 1 over x squared. And in the denominator, I factor out my x, which is 3 plus 5 over x. So now the question becomes, why in the numerator did I factor out an x squared? Well, what is the square root 
of x squared. x. What's the degree of x? 1. So when I'm done factoring, I will have factored out a degree 1. But since it was inside the radical, the radical says I need a 2 for 1 exchange rate. So to bring it out, I'm going to need to have factored out 2. So we have to account for radicals in terms of what we're factoring out. So we did this because the square root of x squared is x. And I'm going to put a question mark on that because that's important too. Because is it really? Well, we'll get there in just a second. So we start with simplification and we end up with, and I'm going to write it out really formally again, so a little long. And I'm going to break this up into the square root of x squared using our properties of radicals and 2 plus 1 over x squared all divided by x over 3 plus 5 over x. And so we were just talking and we said, well, the square root of x squared is x, but is it really? Hmm, let's, let's take a sidebar for a second. So we're going to use the fact the square root of x squared is equal to the absolute value of x. And then in a previous section, we defined the absolute value of x as a piecewise function. It's negative x if x is less than 0. And it's positive x if x is greater than or equal to 0. So now, we need to simplify this piece right here. So as we go to do so, we have our limit as x goes to minus infinity. And we want to simplify the square root of x squared, which is the absolute value of x. But if x is going to negative infinity, which piece of this function are we going to use? So is negative infin infinity going to be less than 0? Or is negative infinity bigger than 0? less than. So we have to replace the square root of x squared with negative x. And we get 2 plus 1 over x squared divided by x times 3 plus 5 over x. So now when that reduces, which it still does, instead of being positive 1, what do we get this time? Negative 1. So those reduce out and we get the negative square root of 2 plus 1 over x squared divided by 3 plus 5 over x. So now we can finally take the limit as x goes to negative infinity. That's 0, that's 0. So then we have our negative square root of 2, and then our denominator is going to be 3. So these are some limits of e to the x in the inverse tangent function. So the e's we can usually reason through. We could also reason through these two, but they really are two facts you're probably going to want to just memorize. Comes up often enough that we're not going to want to have to do the analysis. So we're going to want these hanging around in the back of our mind for whenever we need them. So the limit as x goes to positive infinity of the inverse tangent function is pi over 2. And the limit as x goes to negative infinity of the inverse tangent function is negative pi over 2. What might help you remember that is those are the same things as the vertical asymptotes of the tangent function, right? But when you do inverses, you reflect them over the line y equals x. So the vertical asymptotes become horizontal asymptotes, and that's why they're the limits of the corresponding function via reflection. The other ones are when we have um, e to the x, we get the following limits. The limit as x goes to infinity of 1 over e to the x is the same as the limit as x goes to infinity of e to the negative x is 0. 
And the limit as x goes to negative infinity of negative e to the x is the same as 1 over positive e to the x is infinity. So these are all equivalent via algebra to a whole bunch of different things. So the limit as x goes to infinity of e to the x is equal to infinity. And the limit as x goes to negative infinity of e to the x is equal to 0. And we get those by either putting the minus sign in the exponent or in the limit of integration. So keep that in mind that all of these are equivalent. And we can use that to help us calculate some limits. So we will use those properties to help us calculate a couple of things. So before I do one, we've got a quick try for you guys. So don't overthink it. It comes right from the definition. All right, so if x goes to infinity, what's negative 3 times infinity going to be? Well, according to our rules above, a negative times positive infinity is negative infinity. And what was our e to the negative infinity going to be? Well, that's this guy right here. So what's our limit going to be? Zero. Try example number five. So this one looks like a combination of some stuff you just did and the problems we were working on previously, right? So sometimes we can apply the same technique. that we did for the other ones. But instead of factoring out an x this time, what does your intuition say we should factor out? e to the x, right? And I have a typo in this problem. This should not be 0. That should be infinity. So make sure on example 5 you change that 0 to positive infinity. So we're going to take our limit as x goes to positive infinity, and let's factor out our e. So if we factor out an e to the x from the numerator, we get 44 over e to the x minus 11. And in our denominator, we get e to the x and we have 13 over e to the x plus 3. Our e to the x's reduce out. And the limit as x goes to infinity of e to the x, well, that's right here, is infinity. So what's a constant divided by infinity going to be? So our limit for a constant divided by infinity is 0. So then, at the end of the day, what's left? A negative 11 and a 3. So this is very similar to the technique that we did in the previous set of problems when we were doing it with polynomials. We can do it with other functions as well. Factor them out, reduce, and evaluate our limits. All right, a couple more examples. So we want to evaluate this limit. The limit as x approaches infinity of e to the negative 3x times the sine of 2x. So how are we going to evaluate this limit? 
Hmm. Well, if we think back to our good friend the squeeze theorem, it's going to be helpful. So we want to take note that once again, negative 1 is less than or equal to the sine of 2x, which is less than or equal to positive 1. And if we multiply all three sides of that by e to the negative 3x, we get negative e to the negative 3x is less than or equal e to the negative 3x times sine 2x, which is less than or equal to e to the negative 3x. So then, by the squeeze theorem, we can evaluate the outer limit, right? So the limit as x goes to infinity of negative e to the negative 3x is less than or equal to the limit as x goes to infinity of e to the negative 3x sine 2x, which is less than or equal to the limit as x goes to infinity of e to the negative 3x. So what is our limit as x goes to infinity of e to the negative 3x? Well, you calculated that and you try too, so what's that limit equal to? Zero. So then this limit goes to zero, is less than or equal to the limit as x goes to infinity of e to the negative 3x sine 2x, which is less than this limit, which is also equal to zero. So if it's stuck between zero and zero, what must that limit be? Zero. So this gives us then the conclusion is the limit as x goes to infinity of e to the negative 3x sine 2x is equal to 0. So for our last one, we want to evaluate the limit as x goes to negative infinity of the square root of 4x squared plus 3x plus 2 plus 2x. So if we just try to evaluate this directly, we can't plug infinity in, right? That doesn't make any sense. So when we have something that looks like this, we may notice that it is a binomial. So we have our two terms involving a radical. Well, what was a technique that worked for us in the past when we had radicals? The conjugate. So let's give it a try. So try the conjugate. So we have 4x squared plus 3x plus 2. And the conjugate, instead of plus 2x, is going to be minus 2x. So let's evaluate our limit as x goes to negative infinity of the square root of 4x squared plus 3x plus 2 plus 2x. And I'm going to make that a fraction over 1. And then I multiply the top and the bottom by the conjugate. So 4x squared plus 3x plus 2 minus 2x. And I need to do it on both the numerator and denominator. So when we multiply by the conjugate, a property we may or may not remember is the following. So if I have a plus b, what's its conjugate? a minus b, right? Well, that's exactly our difference of squares formula. That's a squared minus b squared. So instead of foiling anything out, you just square each of them when we do this. So our 
the expression is going to simplify to a squared minus b squared. So our a in this case is going to be this, and our b in this case is going to be 2x. So if we use that in our formula here, we can avoid a lot of the busy work. So we're going to get a squared, so that's just going to be 4x squared plus 3x plus 2, because if you square a square root, what happens? They undo each other, and we get what again? Okay, we might, something might go off the rails here. So what happens when you square a square root? What's the square root of x squared again? Mm, let, let's keep that in mind. Let's see. Ah, there's going to be some absolute values. That might be important, right? So we'll come back to that, leave it on the back burner for a second. And then we have 2x squared all over the square root of 4x squared plus 3x plus 2 minus 2x. So now some interesting stuff is going to happen. So things reduce out. So 2x squared gives me 4x squared. So then these two guys reduce out and we're left with the limit as x goes to negative infinity, 3x plus 2 all over the square root of 4x squared plus 3x plus 2 minus 2x. So now we need to resolve this like we did the one earlier. So what are we going to factor out of the denominator? Well, if we have a square root of an x squared, what's its degree really going to be? Yeah, 1. So we're going to take an x squared out of our radical. So that's going to be the square root of x squared. And it's going to leave behind 4 plus 3 over x plus 2 over x squared. And then we have the limit as x goes to negative infinity. And since we're going to negative infinity, when we have the square root of x squared, what are we going to get? Is it going to be positive or negative? Because we're going to negative infinity. When we take the square root of x squared, is it going to be positive x or negative x? If we're going to negative infinity, what did we get? Yeah, it's going to be negative, right? Because then it's less than 0. So what do we get? Negative x. So we get our negative x times what's left behind, 4 plus 3 over x plus 2 over x squared and then we get minus 2x. So finally we factor out our common x from each of them. So we get 3 plus 2 over x over our negative x times the square root of 4 plus 3 over x plus 2 over x squared. Taking out my common factor, minus 2, we get this. Finally, our x's reduce out. As we go to infinity, that goes to 0, that goes to 0. That goes to 0, and my radical got out of control. It's not that long. Over 2. <coughs> so we end up with 3 over the negative, which I put in the wrong place. So we're going to get the negative square root of 4 take away 2, which gives us 3 over negative 2 minus 2 is negative 4.
and that'll be our final answer. So I need to clarify one thing. I was writing my parentheses down, and I put it in the wrong place. That would cause a problem, right? Because the square root of x squared is negative x, and then I factored the x out of those terms. So let me fix that. I factored the x out here, so the negative sign stayed here, and the x went out here. So I had that written down in the wrong order. Minus sign in the wrong place causes problems. 